all the important stories and events in the world of emerging information. Now, it's time to extract the data and turn it into action. Live from the SiliconANGLE studios in the heart of Silicon Valley, this is Extraction Point with John Furrier. Welcome to Extraction Point. I'm John Furrier, founder of SiliconAngle.com, SiliconAngle.tv. Uh, my guest today is Mike Morales, who's the founder of SpeakerText.com and an entrepreneur living in San Francisco. Just closed uh, some fresh financing, uh, in a seed financing, Series A seed financing, uh, with an in- a bunch of good investors. One, Chris Ye, who was on the Cube uh, with me here in said Extraction Point. Well, we're going to extract the signal from the noise in three areas. The video market crowdsourcing, and overall technology around social data, keywords, metadata, all this stuff that's going on. And Matt, thank you for coming in. Welcome to the program. I know you're busy. It's raining in California, but uh, you made it here down from San Francisco. Thanks for uh, joining us. Uh, Thanks for having me. Um, so here inside the cube, but we had a big day yesterday around big data. Totally, um, you, you're an entrepreneur uh, in San Francisco, and all the hot action. First question uh, for you is: uh, Tell me, what's the signal coming out of San Francisco in terms of the startup community? It's pretty robust right now. It's pretty hopping. Oh yeah, I mean it's growing, and I mean I think just from very uh, geographic perspective, what we're seeing is Soma is becoming saturated, and companies are starting to move into what I call Soma loin, you know, uh, where where Soma meets the tenderloin to the mid market area, um, areas that were traditionally filled with like Chinese sweatshops and whatnot, um, and that just is in my mind is a signal of just how hot the market is and how what what's happening is these places that before startups never went are now suddenly there's uh, everybody's moving there. It's a, it's a gold rush. The vibe is pretty pretty hot, though. I mean, there's a ton of activity. You can tell us oh. what's going on. Just give us some sound bites of just anecdotal things, parties, events, meetups. You guys have a roof deck, I hear, in your new office, so I'm expecting to be invited to uh, all the hot events if my wife lets me. But uh, you know. oh, <laughs> tell yeah. us about the vibe in San Francisco. Uh, I mean, the vibe in San Francisco is amazing. I mean, people, there, there's just this this air of, you know, it's, you know, there's this talk of the bubble, right? Um, and I mean, I think, you know, what gets lost in that is that there's just, there's this wave of, of creation of people doing these really, really cool technologies, this convergence of, you know, pent up demand from, you know, uh, the, the, the financial collapse and, you know, technology prices dropping and, um, I don't know, man. It's an amazing place to be. What, what, what can I say? So uh, Ben Horowitz from Andrews and Horowitz, who I've never had a sit down with, uh, wrote a post. And I was kind of critical on Twitter last night, but he was saying it's not a bubble. I was saying it is a bubble. Um, but he brings up a good point. It's, it's, a, it's a quasi-bubble. There's some over, overextension on some valuations. But for the most part, um, it's an exciting time. People see the, the, the market. Um, and people are making money. So it's unlike the dot-com bubble that I lived through. Right. You know, people were just getting p- getting public on nothing. Totally. And so uh, we're going to talk about your business, but you guys are doing business deals already. So you actually you know, haven't announced it yet, but you talked off camera. You're doing some business. So, I mean, you're hungry. You're lean. Totally. You're doing business deals that keep you funded, and but you're optimistic at the same time. Is that an accurate assessment of kind of the scene in San Francisco? Yeah, I mean, I think there's a, there's a mix. Um, I mean, I obviously... I wasn't around for for sort of bubble 1.0, um, but you know, yeah, there are companies, you know, the the, the Twitters of the world that have crazy valuations, um, but you know, uh, not necessarily crazy revenues. Um, but you know, companies like ours, you know, we're doing deals, we're making money. You know, we we are a real business. We're not just sort of you know a, a startup or just a product. Um, and I think you know, um, I think there's a lot of companies like that. You know, there's. Unlike, you know, in the in the late 90s, there's money to be made on this whole internet thing. You know, people are making it, you know, and even the companies that the huge companies, the Zingas, the Groupons, yeah. this isn't just this isn't bubble valuations like they have massive revenues and massive revenue growth. I mean, so, you know, and that's where that actually bothers me a bit is when people say, oh, it's a crazy bubble. How could Groupon be valued so highly? Well, I mean. They're making a lot of freaking money. What Ben Horowitz talked about yesterday in his blog really was a good point and worth acknowledging is that, you know, don't confuse bubble with boom. I mean, right. It's, you know, the attitude of the entrepreneurs that are out there are aggressive, but they realize they don't need a lot of cash to get going. Totally. And, oh, by the way, they're living in the market that is just once in a lifetime, every 20-year inflection point. 
you know, the App Store, Apple phenomenon, mobile, Android. Um, your company, which we'll talk about, is in the video space, which, um, you know, I launched a startup in that area when, early, when it wasn't really ready. But, you know, you got cameras everywhere now. A uh, company just got funded with $41 million. The uh, entrepreneur who founded Open Wave, Bill Nguyen, uh, Dunham Munster, Laloff, founder, on a business plan and prototype got $41 million. Right. Okay, Flipboard just got a $100 million, $200 million valuation. Right. It's insane. That is crazy. Right. Now, contrast to you. Right. Well, you're it's, like a couple zeros off that. I mean, don't you think uh, on, the, on the working capital side? Yeah, I mean, uh, so I think what, what we've seen happen so uh, is that Facebook exploded. And, you know, um, what you always have is the, the early leader, the people who, uh, who come in and, and, and the real innovators and, you know, pave the way. Um, now, yeah, everybody laughed when, you know, Facebook raised that, you know, what was it, $100 million valuation from Trinity or I don't, I don't remember the, the details. But they, early on, they had some crazy high valuations yeah. and people said that's insane. Excel. Excel yeah. and Greylock. Yeah. 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 Um, sorry. Uh, and then, um, well, now Facebook's like ginormous. And so everybody's kind of says the social thing is huge. Let's go chase after the social startups, right? And so, like, in a way, the, the market has been validated and people have made money off of what it. What do you think about the term social proof that's been kicked around? Is that positive or negative connotation? Um, the angelist guys, Nivy and Nival, using it as kind of like a positive thing. Like, if social proof means validation. Some are saying it's just... A, the sheep following the, the sheep kind of thing. I mean, look, humans are, we, we are herd animals, right? You know, I mean, we don't survive in the wild solo. You know, um, people, people are social. People follow each other, you know. The, we're mimetic creatures, right? We, we, we see, there's, there's mirror neurons that we have. We see what other people are doing and we copy it. That's just part of our fundamental biology as, as people. To say it's good or bad, I mean, Part of it's, it's good. It's like a nightclub. Everyone says, hey, that nightclub is really hot. Right. People go there because it's good. And they right. go and they make the judges themselves. And if they like it, they tell somebody, right? Right. You know, or that restaurant's really good. I want to go back. So that's word of mouth. Right. I mean, I mean and it's also, there's reflexivity. Um, I think George Soros co coined the term, right? Is that, you know, even in public markets, right? Is that uh, it's not just, oh, there's, what is fundamental value? You know, part of that is the perception of value, right? And so you... What happens influences what happens in the future. So if you buy, then that changes the price, right? And then other people buy, you know, like because you bought, and then that, you know, there is no sort of like static state of uh, where, where you are able to va judge fundamental value. So much of it is seeing what other people are doing and what happens in the market, and you know, it's all fundamentally a guess. I'm here on Extraction Point with Matt Morales, who's an entrepreneur, founder of uh, Speaker Text dot com in san francisco um hot startup great small team the, the opposite of what people would call a bubble um thanks for coming on and, and giving us the highlights of the san francisco community um but you're an entrepreneur living in san francisco and you're also plugged into some pretty cool trends i looked at your company you got kind of a machine learning thing going on you got kind of a crowdsourcing thing going on you got some technology so you got some science uh you mentioned people being kind of uh, uh social animals um Let's look at angle. We cover computer science meets social science, but let's dive into that. Let's talk about crowdsourcing. So we're Call living it. in social media, social networks, social world. We're connected. Uh, there's new data out there. And yesterday we were talking about big data, big data analytics. Uh, advertising is going to be a science, less of an art. Um, your business has a crowdsourcing element. So I'd like to get your opinion and what your angle is on the whole crowdsourcing phenomenon um, and, is it, you know, and, and how you're looking at it and what are the benefits of that. So I think uh, there's a mega trend on the internet, and it's an old trend that sort of people are making new again. So in the history of computer science and artificial intelligence research, you know, uh, there's all these people in the labs trying to make intelligent machines. And they're smart, but not that smart. And they hit some inflection point where it can, you, you get diminishing returns, and they're not, the machines aren't getting smarter. Um, and in the late 90s in search, this is exactly what happened, right? There was Alta Vista, there was Excite, et cetera. Um, and they were all trying to do, you know, create machines that, you know, read a web page and said, okay, how, what's, this, what's, the, what's the best search result here? Um, and, uh, and then this little company uh, in Palo Alto came out um, called Google. And what did they do? 
uh, they were, you know, one of the OG crowdsourcing companies, right? They said, okay, we're going to combine the intelligent machines with what humans are doing because the real fundamental intelligence is in the human. Is, and, and they were doing it in terms of, of linking um, and, and backlinking on the web. And, you know, then Google came out and the world changed and the web was organized. Um, and if you see what happens in, you know, the AI labs, the artificial intelligence research, this is like the trend is that there's pure machine approach that doesn't really make it out of the lab, doesn't really work. And then someone and AI, adds- AI has been in the lab for decades, right? Because it was just the religious argument, what is AI, right? right. I mean, but now you've got totally. some practical data to work with. So go ahead and continue, that's a good, good thread. Yeah, and so you know, what happens is, is that uh, you, know, you add on some actual human intelligent layer on top of um, you know, the, the AI, on top of these intelligent machines, and that's how you actually get something that works and is useful as a product or a service in the, in the, in the world. Um, and you know, speaker text is very similar on that front in terms of, uh, of speech recognition, in terms of you know, uh, turn it, for us, our main focus is video. You know, um, the web was created as this you know, web of text documents. You know, video is not a text document. And so what does Google do? Google goes around and reads the web. Everyone's been trying to crack the video search market for years. Yahoo tried, Google tried. Right. I mean, there's a graveyard of carnage. Oh, I mean, totally. You know that, right? You've seen that. But you've got a different approach. So talk about your, yeah. your approach to, to video. So what we do is we turn video into text. Um, so it can be searched, found, and engaged with, and shared. Um, in all sorts of really cool ways. Um, and how we do that is a, a hybrid model that combines, you know, uh, more traditional AI approaches with uh, crowdsourced labor and leveraging the web as a labor platform. So historically, you've either had, you know, uh, either an outsourcing shop in India somewhere. Or Mechanical Turk and things like that. Or, or, or Mechanical Turk. Uh, and mechanical Turk ain't bad, but becomes this huge quality assurance problem, yeah. you know. So you can either, A, have a house, you know, uh, a transcription shop, an actual physical building with a manager, or uh, you can, you know, do, use something like Turk, and then you end up investing a lot of time yourself trying to, you know, Curate ensure quality. It, fix it, yeah. Or you just get destroyed by spammers and, you know, <laughs> uh, and you want to shoot yourself. Um, and so what we've done is we've built this hybrid workflow process, and the, the core of which is uh, an autonomous quality assurance system, uh, an artificial intelligent uh, QA system on top of uh, these, these various crowdsourcing platforms. Um, so, you know, you can give us any video and we'll turn it into, you know, a high quality human readable, you know, transcript. And, um, and there's a lot of things you can do with this. Um, for one search engines right now, suddenly the, the video is searchable, it shows up on Google, you know, you can get that long tail of search traffic. But, um, you know, we've built a product called caption box that, uh, you shows the transcript and turns it into an interactive tool with the video. Let's people engage with the video so they can search the video just like it was a, you could search through a text document. You can share quotes from the videos and it'll link back to that exact moment inside the video. The deep that, the, 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 that was the, so, the holy grail people were trying to, hey, three minutes in, right. epic soundbite. Totally. Or great content. Yeah, deep linking and telling people what's there. You know, some money quote, you tweet it out, it links back to that money quote on your page. So it's really good experience for the consumer as well as for the producer. You know, um, and, uh, and, and that's really the core of what we do. And it's, you know, the edge of this, this mega trend of, you know, online video, which has been, you know, exploded in 2004 with YouTube and uh, has been, you know, uh, maturing since. Uh, and now we're seeing this focus on the, uh, on the metadata layer, right? So... One of the challenges early was, you know, with YouTube is actually just being able to stream video and get it out there. And now, okay, we figured that out mostly. And so how do we make this video discoverable? How do we, you know, how enable contextual what's your, advertising? What's your angle on, before we go to the advertising side, because that's important, because I think the SEO, SEM market's dying for a new product. This might, might be it. Um, but I want to get your angle on big data. Obviously, it's an area that we're, we're fond of. We've been covering like a blanket. Um, both at a tech level and a business level, because you're talking about you know, you're talking about these keywords that you're saying meta layer, and this is big data. You got you know, unstructured data in some cases, quasi structure. What's your angle on this whole big data phenomenon? Also, we're here at Cloudera, uh, where they do they do revolution is born. Um, what's your as an entrepreneur? How do you look at this big data, and how would you describe it to someone out there? Um, I, mean, I think big data is. I mean, obviously, it's. I mean, it's trivial to say, but it's, it is. It is a mega trend, right? 
Um, and with increasing data sets, you can find really interesting statistical correlations and things that you couldn't before because the data just wasn't there. Um, for us, uh, frankly, a lot of it's proprietary, but, um, you know, searching through and uh, analyzing all the, the transcripts we create, looking for connections between them, but also um, you know, what people are, are doing w with the videos. And, you know, for us in particular, analyzing how our, our workers and, and human agents uh, and what they're doing um, and, you know, detecting one of the things just on what kind of tech is involved in, in some of that stuff what, what's some of the tech it, well without there's going into the trade secrets but i mean generally is it ai you mentioned ai earlier machine learning um yeah no i mean there's uh there, there's a, a lot i mean it's a lot of ai machine learning some speech stuff um you know and uh i mean the core is creating an artificially intelligent quality assurance layer on top of you know, a hybrid process of humans and machines. And that's really, really hard to do. Um, you know, QA, I mean, if you think about it, crowdsourcing, especially in sort of like the, the labor model, not the volunteer model, um, you know, workers, uh, you know, have an incentive to do the, the most work for the least effort, you know, um, when they're getting paid per task. And so there's a huge incentive to scam people, you know, and you have a lot of people, you know, trying to make a quick buck, right? Um, and so, you know, anybody who's ever used Mechanical Turk at any scale realizes, holy cow, the scammers, you know, the, the scammers, the spammers. They, it looks good at the beginning. It's kind of like a golf shot. It looks good off the tee. And then you're like, what the hell's going on? Totally. More time's wasted. You know, I've used it, and which is why I wanted to talk to you guys, because, you know, I'm curious. I mean, this is a problem. I mean, getting the data out of the video is a really big problem and there's more and more video because the machines can create the contextual linkage between what people are sharing and doing whether it's uh, you know uh, on the go mobile or interviews like this um, but so let's let's talk let's drill further on the advertiser side because video um, has two functions online advertising has always been keyword based talk about google you know obviously adwords innovation with that and the keywords there's no rich media involved they've been experimenting with it. you know video ad sense kind of been gone nowhere um, but here for your customers they could literally have search use text to get the anchor into the search results but also the trend in online advertising is to get the embedded there's a, there's a company after the name of it just that says the pictures in uh, um, links to the photos inside of it. The guy from Facebook just uh, joined as a board member, just saw the news today. We're seeing more of these different approaches. It's not your standard just picture or text links. Uh, and also TV advertising, right? So Totally. Where is the future of video going? Is it on the ad side, it's going to be more robust ads? Uh, what are you seeing for the future of the video market online in particular? Well, so part of, so what's happened is there's been, you know, talk about big data, there's been this explosion in audience data. So people now know, you know, uh, there's all these, you know, sophisticated uh, tracking systems where people know uh, who's watching videos. Um, but, you know, what hasn't happened and what I think we're really at the cutting edge of is, um, is actually understanding what's going on inside the video itself. So there's very little data. Nobody knows what's happening at any particular moment inside the video. Is it, you know, um, is it in interesting quote are people swearing is there you know hate speech is there something you know some funny thing happening you know um and understanding that you know there's a bunch of technologies that content's are, locked up in the video i mean if you do a seven minute video you're talking about seven minutes of huge time commitment for the user experience totally i mean leaning when you're at work it's not a lean back environment if you're no. on the go maybe if you're sitting at the airport you can bring up your ipad but you need itunes right well, itunes might not be compatible right, right. so you got lean back at home on the couch, but you're in the office. Hey, what's going on in this seven minute clip? Or worse, we're doing a 30 minute interview here on Extraction Point. You know, totally. We're in, what, our eighth minute, ninth minute? Right. Well, this is a pretty important topic about advertising. So, Right. No, I mean, the content's totally locked up, as you said. Um, you know, and not just for the consumer, but also for the machines. There's, think about it. There's all these, uh, you know, these sophisticated machinery algorithms that understand text, you know, whether it's a search engine, uh, you know, AdSense, some sort of contextual advertising, sentiment analysis, you know, et cetera. Um, once you have the text, 
you can apply all these other existing technologies in really new and interesting ways. And so, give on, an example on that. Um, well, AdSense, just straight up, you know, um, AdSense, you know, looks at what's on the page and says, okay, we're going to serve a contextual ad. You know, um, the problem is you have no idea what's going on inside a video. And so that's where we come in, is we say, look. I mean, we basically did that yesterday for our big data special. We, we saw that GigaOwn was having a, a big data conference in New York City, and at mm -hmm. 1 o'clock we just pulled the trigger and did six hours of live programming where we had guests come in, and we actually went in to our library, essentially deep linked and pulled back out content, I mean, that's metaphorically the same as just saying a tweet with a link to an embed into your model, right? Right. And, and it's the same thing. It's just some access. There's more navigation. Right. Well, it, I mean, you know, you had to do that manually. That was a manual pain process. In the ass. Huge pain. Good tons product, of labor costs. Good product. Totally. A lot of work. A lot of but, production costs. Right. But, you know, I mean, there's, these are things that machines should be able to do. Yeah. Um, and if you have that video in text form, you know, if you have it transcribed and all that text is, you know, time synchronized with the video, then it's just a matter of searching through the text and, and you know, highlighting and clipping based using the yeah. text, which is, you can do that, what your, your brain can do it way faster than yeah, you yeah. could sit there and physically watch and, it. And with, within the online marketing area outside of just search engine optimization where you can use the, the, the leverage of the text, a lot of the, the advertisers are going social media. So we went from consumer companies like Ford, The Gap to HP, EMC, they have social media teams, they're pumping out tons of video. Now right. granted, some of the videos are very boring, very vendor specific, but you know, that's their game, that's their world. They want text, right? So right. who do they go to? You guys? I mean, is this something you guys are targeting that audience as well? Or Yeah, I mean, for us... Or is that kind of, you're gonna go to that different, you're gonna go to that later? Um, I mean, so for us, our, our, our main focus right now is serving media companies. Um, you know, people you know, like yourselves who are putting video out on the internet, you know, and have a big incentive to, to get it found, get it watched, and to turn that into, into, into money. Um, and for us, you know, we help you do that. You know, we help you get found by search. And then Caption Box and some of the other tools we've created, uh, we boost engagement and, uh, and sharing. So, you know, in some of the early trials we've done, we've seen Caption Box, which is our interactive transcript uh, tool, we've seen a doubling in the uh, amount of time people spend watching a video. So, you know, we I can tell you right now, when we were at Strata Conference, and for the folks out there who have been following us will we'll know, um, Tim O'Reilly had an event, the inaugural Strata Conference, and we had two days of live programming there. And uh, the CMO of uh, Greenplum didn't believe us, but we did, and I tried to get in front of him and prove the numbers, but it was shocking. Two days, 1.2 million views, 500,000 views of the live stream, Wow. 500,000 views, roughly split 50-50, almost right down the middle. Once they watched a live video, they went right to the on-demand. So this notion of using the video to capture the awareness, I mean, it's, it's like the perfect commitment. If the video's good, it provides great aided awareness. Totally. And our numbers are clearly showing that video captures the user because the commitment to watch a video, and if the content's good, they're going to want more. It's like right. the appetizer. So you, I think this concept of a caption box or having more discovery more engagement, more stuff. Right. It's a huge value. Yeah, and I mean... And I just don't see anyone doing that right now. No, I mean... I mean it's, no one goes to search and says, hey, let me watch a video about big data. Right. No, I mean... <laughs> and the thing is, is that up to now, it's been, you know, people have tried to use machines to solve this problem. And it just, frankly, hasn't worked. You know, um, I mean, speech recognition, they have, you know, some great cutting-edge technology, but it's still, you know, half the time it's... I mean, so some offensive. people will say, "Hey, what's the turnaround time? How fast does it take? Is it a week later, or is it is how is it real time, near real time? What does that mean?" So it depends how much you want to pay. Uh, <laughs> that's uh, so that's coin operated, you know, it, it's, premium it, service. Let's just go basic and just take us through, you know, the basic service and just say, you know, we're running, you know, Obama press conference. Yeah. So I mean, right. our our approach is. Uh, like the, the Tony Shea, you know, Zappos kind of uh, under promise over deliver. Yep. Um, so on the website we say, you know, guaranteed turnaround time, 48 to 72 hours. Um, which is pretty fast compared to transcript, uh, yeah. traditional not, firms. Not bad. Um, but, you know, it's not, not real time. It's um, not a week. It's, it's not a week. Most of the time, most customers get content back within 12 to 24 hours, uh, realistically. Um, 
And one thing that's actually really cool about uh, our technology and how it works is it doesn't matter how much content you give us. We break it up into, into chunks, and then we send that uh, to you know, hundreds or thousands of workers. So a lot of the stuff can be done in parallel in a way that you know, a traditional firm could not. Mm -hmm. um, and so we can get really fast turnaround time, even with large volumes of content, yeah. where doesn't, you, know, we, you don't have sort of the linear, you know, if I give you one hour of content, it'll take X, you know, and if it give you two hours, it'll take two X. So yeah, it's, yeah. I mean, it still takes X. You create the, the, how you break it up, optimize even algorithm on how fast that turns around. Okay. I can understand. Cool. So you have a, a white glove service for rapid turnaround. Yeah. And Not it's, real it's, time, but like if someone needs it fast. Yeah. And, you, you know, can, and that's one thing that we're working on, right, is because we've gotten this, especially news, news, uh, news, news publishers say, hey, look, you know, not all my content, but some of it I need super fast. So, um, you know, and we're that's in the works. Uh, yeah. And that's something we've, we've actually heard from the market cool. loud and clear. We're here with Matt Morales, entrepreneur uh, in, in Silicon Valley and San Francisco. I see you can call them kind of the same. Not really these days. San Francisco is building a name for itself. Um, always had a great uh, reputation, but now it's booming in San Francisco. You got the, the rents going up. Cloudera just recently moved their engineers up there, um, and it's hot. So, uh, uh, Matt, we're talking about entrepreneurship. We're talking about your company, speakertext.com, and we're here at the extraction point extracting the signal from the noise. And uh, the next segment I'd like to drill down with you on is um, – something that's near and dear to your heart, entrepreneurship, startups. I know totally. you write about it on your blog. You are you are an entrepreneur. Um, you're living in a great time. Oh. Uh, I wish I was you, uh, younger. I'm too old to do startups these days, even though I'm doing Silicon Angle. Um, but seriously, what is your take? I'd love to get your perspective, very candid perspective around how you see the market. There's a lot of noise out there around... Angel gate, angel list, early stage, don't do a convertible note. Uh, I actually just saw a blog post yesterday from Man, uh, uh, Manu at uh, K9 and I actually agreed with them. I don't do, I did a convertible note. I will never do a convertible note again for, from my perspective. But what's the vibe as an entrepreneur? You're out there in the trenches. Is it, what's it like? I mean, there's all these different stories. What are you seeing? I mean, what's the climate like? I mean, are people like VCs stay away from them? I mean, you can't say that because you're probably looking for funding down the road, but I mean, what's the general view? Are, are stunning's getting overfunded? I mean, I, well, I think what's what's happening is that, you know, um, there's a wave of, of entrepreneurs and of companies, you know, like like myself, like Speaker Text. You know, I started this company three weeks after Lehman collapse in October 2008. You know, um, and this was real RIP good times. You know, everybody was saying, like, dude, you're, you're doing Crazy. a startup? Like, are you insane? Like, dude, this is horrible idea come on get, get your get yourself together yeah, sequoia is not funding no one's funding yeah right, right. um and the, you know it was a long drought you know i i bootstrapped the company i worked on an ambulance to you know uh, to pay off my college loans and uh keep the company alive it was just a dream back then um and over the last year you know year and a half the market has just radically radically changed um i personally think that um incubators are overhyped um you know why combinator Brilliant idea, tech stars, good idea. Incubator nine thousand seven hundred, whatever. I I think that in six years from now, those will mostly be gone with a a, hand, a handful left. Um, you know, and because what I think is happening is that um, you know, there's the cost of doing startups are, is collapsing, and that you know, there's more people on the internet and mobile than there has ever been before. So, mega stuff, good. Um, you know. Actually, being an entrepreneur, though, um, I'm of the the rocky school of, of of thought. You know, it's not about how hard you can hit; it's about how hard you can get hit and keep going forward. You know, um, and in times like this, Rocky Balboa, you're referring to. Oh yeah, you know, Rocky the Balboa, Italian stallion, the Italian stallion. <laughs> um, <laughs> Climb those stairs, you know, eat the, drink the raw eggs. Rocky one, by the way, right? You know? Yeah, no, uh, no, <laughs> or I mean, Rocky three. Yeah, All no. Good. And and I think that um, that's a good point, though. I mean, entrepreneurs have to take the lumps. It's no, it's no gravy. I mean, it's no right? Walk in the park, and that's uh, that's not the fantasy people are are reading about or dreaming about. You know, the wannabe entrepreneurs, right? I mean, yeah, you know, one you of, take your lumps and yeah. One one of our advisors, you know, one, our, our main advisor, uh, Mark Randolph, the original founder CEO of Netflix. You know, uh, we were you know having this some issues or whatever in in the company, um, and you know we we're talking with him, and he sent me this email. He's like, look. You know, at Netflix and any entrepreneur who made it in the Valley, you know, pissed blood for years, you know, trying to make it. You know, this stuff is hard. Um, 
And I think incubators tap into a certain mindset. Um, not all of them, many of them are really, really good. So, but like what I do fear is that uh, there's people who, you know, false hope. there's false hope. Well, also like they add like these, the, the, they add structure, you know, and it feels like applying to graduate school. It feels like school. It feels like structure. And that lowers the barrier to entrepreneurship, which is good. But at the same time, I, I call it the community college. It's like more access, which is good. Right. But it's not high end. Right. And high so, end is being creative, focusing on the on the objective, building right. the product, being loose, being creative. Hate the word pivot, but you know, working with it, right? Getting the market. Well, I mean, also, Putting you know, the, together. the the pirate. You know, like Mike Arrington had this great post uh, a few months ago. Are you a pirate? You know, uh, and you know, when you make it like graduate school, you yeah, the the density of pirates uh, drops. Um, that said, I, I mean, I do think it is really, really good, and, and you really can't have a lot of pirates. There's only the, the seas can only handle. Only a certain plumber clan of pirates. Either you know, it's like. Well, you know, are you a ninja or a pi or pirate? This is one of the debates I had on Quora. Right? Are you ninja or Nin pirate? Ninja or a pirate? You know, so it's like different characteristics. Pirates work in, in packs, which is a Silicon Valley kind of uh, legend. But also, you know, you can be a ninja and still be successful. So, but it begs the question: Is it oversaturated with entrepreneurs? I was just seeing uh, a conversation well, saying there's best seed market ever. We need more angels. Um, there's people on the, on, the, on the VC side are complaining the quality sucks. Um, so I don't know yet. I'm trying to figure it out. I have my opinion, but. I mean, I think, you know, when times are tough, the, you know, you get tougher people, right? You know, when times are flush, you get, you know, people get soft. Um, and we'll see, you know, there'll be this cycle and it'll wash out and see who comes out. You know, plenty of people have made a hell of a lot of money by starting, you know, when times are tough and selling when, you know, when times are, uh, or, you know, when times are good. And starting when times are good and selling when times are still good, right? Yeah. Um, it's that, you know, the times when you get punched in the face. And that's, you know, I mean, that's my kind of entrepreneur. That's, that's You're looking at Rocky right here. I mean, I lived through the, 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 the ball of scar tissues. I've you know, been booted out of my company uh, that I started with Venture Backed and uh, started here scratch with no cash. So dude, I'm with you on that. Um, totally, totally right on. Um, and then there's also, you know, you got your pedigree rock stars out there who get the big money. Totally. You know, hey, whatever. You know, that's cool. Great for them. But, I mean, on you top know? of the, the, no, okay. So that said, Angelist, I think, is the most amazing invention, you know, um, in startup financing since the internet. I mean, this is, excuse me, it's essentially functions like a public market for, you know, uh, early stage companies. Um, you know, and where before you used to have discrete financing events, now you can kind of do these rolling closes and, you know, just sort of like a public company, you know, oh, there's just some more stock, get yeah, some more capital. Yeah, yeah. And that, uh, you know, and it's opened up the market to new angels, but it's also yeah, yeah. startups, you know, it's just, it's really yeah, I'm, disrupting. I'm a industry. member on AngelList, so I can tell you that the deal flows good on there. And, and at first I was kind of like giving a little bit of a, Criticism to those guys. I mean, I know Naval and uh, Nivi real well. Um, party with those guys, but to me, it's a revolution, mm, major improvement. Mm -hmm. And I think what's interesting is that it can go the what I call the eBay route, where yeah, it can get there. But what's, what what I find the most compelling is, is that those two guys are very cool, good guys, and companies are getting funded. Totally. That it might not have gotten funded before. And same with Y Combinator. I mean, for all that, I mean, those are good systems that work. To me. That's the magic of AngelList, is that you know you could a guy from Minnesota can walk into Silicon Valley on based on their own merits, yeah, get I mean, funded, and not have to go through and kiss the ring of Ron Conway. No offense, Ron, but uh, you know the old way was you know go through the gates and get. Well, it I mean, but that, I think, and that's a that's a very good point. But I think that's a key difference between Y Combinator, you know, and AngelList. You know, uh, Y Combinator is more like the iOS Steve Jobs. You know, like you know, walled garden curation, right? And a big part of the value of Y Combinator is, you know, saying, hey, you know, you just, uh, Paul Graham has given you the, yeah. you know... Uh, the endorsement. Uh, the, the endorsement, yeah. you know, you've been blessed. Um, Angelist... Whatever that means, right? I mean, yeah. Well, I mean, there's a lot of, I mean, you can't... He's got great deal flow, so he has to make some filter decisions. He's got overflow. Oh, yeah. I mean, even on the investor side, I was talking to a VC yesterday, like, you can't get in there anymore unless you've been legacy. So he's already sold out, basically, his capacity for VCs. Hmm. One other VC told me they can't get into Y Combinator because 
Now it's, you can only get in if you were a previous investor. Hmm. So, mm. interesting. I mean, they're, they're doing some really interesting, but I think AngelList is more sort of like the Android, you know, it's an open platform, right? Yeah. I mean, that said, you know, um, you know, we raised a, a lot of our capital through, through AngelList, um, you know, uh, and a big part of- How did of, that go? Oh, it was awesome. You know, um, those guys, just those guys have been helping me out when I was a total nobody. You oh, know. Vivian Duvall? Yeah, Nevian Naval, Nevi in particular, who's less of the public face, but back in November or December of uh, of 2009, you know, I reached out to those guys right before we had sort of launched the most beta of beta versions of speaker text, you know. You know, I had no idea what the hell I was doing. And, you know, Nevi got on the phone with me on a Sunday, you know, uh, G-chat, you know, voice chat, yeah. um, spent an hour, you know, sort of slapping me upside the head and tell me what was what, you know, and then a couple months later, you know, I came out to, uh, to San Francisco for the first time ever. And, um, yeah. yeah, and Nevi, you know, let me crash on his couch, you know, um, I mean, he's a very cool guy. Those it, guys are very cool. And they really care about entrepreneurs and they're really trying to do the right thing. Um, and I think it really shows There's two in types product. of people in, in, in the entrepreneurial world, people who want to help people and people who hurt people. And so, you know, I put them on the category of they help people. And all the successful entrepreneurs and mentors and investors are the ones who really want to help. Yeah. And I think that's very key in these, which groups you kind of work with, AngelList and, you know, Paul Graham and those guys. So, you know, I think the more that happens in this market, the better. Right, I mean, totally, and access to money even better. AngelList is phenomenal. It's like an email blast. Oh yeah, it's like I a mean, subscription document. And I mean, if you look at the most influential people in uh, in the, the sort of startup financing world today, um, you know, I think it's really interesting because you know, where do these, why are these people matter, right? So Paul Graham, you know, he sold the company to Yahoo for fifty million dollars in nineteen ninety seven. I mean, you know, I, I, w I wouldn't be too bad, uh, too, too disappointed with that outcome, but like kind of big whoop, right? Like, I mean, he's not like a kajillionaire, right? But, you know, he's got modest livings. I mean, the guy's not a, he's not. But, but how did he make his name, his essays, right? His writing, right? Um, you know, Andy Warhol said, you know, anybody could be, make, get 15 minutes of fame in television, right? Um, in, you know, the internet, anyone can build, you know, an internationally recognized brand. You look at guys like Fred Wilson. He was a, a, a VC in New York when, you know, New York was not cool, right? You know, and now he has, from what I can tell, the best portfolio, you know, uh, in, in On the, the consumer world. side, he's number two behind Greylock, David Z. So you get the two guys I think are the best there. Right, but he's he's not in the valley, right? Like, you know, Who? Uh, Fred Wilson. Yeah, well, either it's Rich Levendoff, and, you know, all the best deals that were done in, were by guys not from Silicon Valley. Right. Zynga, Twitter. Totally. And then Kleiner came late to the game. Look, I mean, look at, you know, Mark Suster, right? He's a guy, he kind of came out of nowhere, yeah. right? His blog. Um, and, you know, Chris Dixon, another guy, you know, uh, how do these people, you know, make names for themselves? They're using the internet as a publishing platform. And, you know, I mean, I think that that's, yeah, and even venture hacks. What did venture hacks, or what did AngelList come out of? It came venture out of venture hacks, hacks yeah. right? Yeah. Um, and you know, content as a as a as a strategy, right? And as like the core original, of, of authority. Good content. Good content. Oh yeah, good original. original content serves value, not just page views. Yeah, and not, serves the right master. That's the future. Totally. It, it, you you serve you serve the customer. You create a brand. You know, that's how you create a brand. And I think you know a lot of people they say, oh, on the internet we're gonna make. Yeah, money. We're gonna put some content out there, and it's, they think like they can just kind of like, yeah. you know, do. Well, we're SiliconAngle.com. We're making a brand for ourselves. High quality content. Mike Morell is here, founder, entrepreneur from San Francisco. Speaker text. Uh, thanks for coming in on the extraction point today. Final parting uh, words. Just tell us uh, to close this out. What are the mega trends that you're watching? that you think are future me possible mega trends, if you will, things that are, you can't put your finger on it yet, but you can feel it. Is there anything that you can talk about that you say, I, I feel it, I see this coming, this might be big? Oh, I mean, I, 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 don't, I mean, people aren't talking about it, but I mean, it's definitely gonna be huge, is, is the verticalization of the crowdsourcing space, right? So there was, this, there was this dream, you know, two, three years ago, that there, somebody's gonna create a generalized work platform, right, where you, it's labor in the cloud, labor on demand. Um, you know, there's there's Crowdflower, there's 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 Mechanical Turk, you know, um, Cloud Crowd. These companies that did that. And what's happened is, is that a the technology and that doesn't really there's a technology problem. There's also a marketing problem. 
So what you're seeing is companies like, like Speaker Text, you know, and like my Gango that are, are attacking specific verticals, and they have a specific workflow um, and process for leveraging the crowd, you know, and combining, you know, artificial intelligent, you know, um, uh, systems on top of it. Um, and you know, I expect this to happen in a lot of industries that you know, machines and AI has sort of had middling success or not really knocked it out of the park. Um, and you're going to see a huge verticalization of the crowdsourcing market over the, over the next uh, 24 to 36 months. Man, you speak in our language. That's stuff that we love to hear. It's exactly our mojo here at SiliconANGLE, verticalization. We're doing it up and down, research data on our end. You're going to be a, a hit. I think you're going to do great. Got a great space, great vision. Love that last line. Video's hot. You're tackling that. Either way, I think you're going to be successful because you're in the right area. You're tackling video. You got the metadata. You got the technology. Uh, Mike Morales with Speaker Tech, entrepreneur from San Francisco. Thanks for coming in. Appreciate it. Thank you.